It's always a privilege and an honor to come and share God's word. And the title of today's message is From Do to Be. From Do to Be. Oh, you're giving it away there. You put the verse. <coughs> right. <coughs> Most of us spend our week doing stuff. It's either an endless to-do list, tasks, jobs, running around, doing, 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 and more doing. But when it comes to the things of God, should it still be a whole load of doing, 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 and doing when we're told we're entering into God's kingdom and God's way of doing things? And God says that his ways are higher than our ways. And we're to renew our minds and learn of him. And so with this from do to be, we have a verse from Luke, chapter 14, verse 26, which when it comes up in a minute, you'll turn around and think, I know what he said the title is, but what's that got to do with anything? Well, let's put it up and let's have a look at this verse. So Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Lovely. Welcome to church. <laughs> that doesn't seem to fit, does it? You know, God being a God of love and all that we're taught, we're then taught hate. And you're thinking, hang on, Jesus is only saying what the Father's told him to say. And he's functioning and moving in the Holy Spirit under the anointing. So what's going on? Because it just doesn't seem to fit with anything. Now, those of you who've been saved a while, probably say, oh, yeah, that's it, but, but we actually know what it means. We understand that verse. It's not a problem to us. But if you've not been saved for a while, you might be looking going, huh? So let's remind ourselves and let's just look at this verse a little bit more. Because in the Bible, God makes no mistakes. There's no contradictions. Everything makes sense. Everything ties together. We sometimes just need to look a little bit harder. So the first thing is about hating father and mother, hating parents. Yet in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 to 3, we're reminded, honor your father and mother, because this is the first commandment with a promise, yeah. that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Okay. We can go to the Ten Commandments, and as Lib pointed out a few weeks ago when she's looking at the prodigal son, what does the Fifth Commandment tell us? Honor your father and mother. Ah, okay. When Moses was getting ready to take the people through, he was instructed by God that there has to be a proclaiming of the blessings and the proclaiming of the curses of how God wants to operate with his people. And in Deuteronomy 27, verse 16, one, this is what it says. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. So God's really pushing here. Love your parents. Honor them. You see, if we can't honor our natural parents, we're going to struggle to honor our spiritual father. That's why it makes it into the top ten, as it were, for the Ten Commandments. It's there. Then we talk about then, Jesus goes on about wife and spouse. Well, Peter provides an awful lot of guidance in his letters. Husbands are told, love your wives. Wives are told, honor your husband. Because that's how, what it takes to enable the Holy Spirit to move seamlessly in our households and in our families. If there's friction there, God can't move as easily as he wants to move. We're then told about hating children. 
Yet God tells us to raise them up in the fear, that reverential awe of God, to teach them the things of God, to share with them the testimonies, to let them know what life is like, how we're doing in life. God isn't to be excluded from the dinner table. God isn't to be kept off, well, okay, children, we'll let you know a bit about God when you have Sunday school or crash your youth. He's to be talked about and known all the time. Because the most loving thing we can do is tell our children that God loves them and God wants to move in their lives and God is interested in them. Because if we don't, what's the alternative? The world's going to come and tell them a whole load of nonsense and junk. And we know because most of us have been and experienced that nonsense and junk. So, if God's telling us to love, yet in this verse is the hate, it's time to just turn up the volume on that verse and amplify it. Guess where I'm going? Let's have it in the amplified, please. Where we've got those square brackets on there, that is information that's implied in the text. Okay, so, it's not so it gives us more information. This is how people have seen it. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude towards God. He cannot be my disciple. In the sense of indifference to or relative disregard in comparison with our attitude towards God. God is to be the central key element. If we don't have God front and center, then we get to experience things not quite the way. The interesting thing is this verse is not a command. There's no thou shalt, thou must. The verse is actually an expectation. God has put in the expectation here. The expectation is that your love for your heavenly father is going to be stronger and greater than everything else in your life. Because then you can be his disciple. There's no striving. Be his disciple. The verse is a challenge to how we see the things in life and where we want to place our priorities. But it's also a beautiful verse in that it applies to each and every one of us regardless of where we are. It starts off with parents. So if we're young and we're just at the stage of having parents, it applies. A little bit older and you've got a spouse, still applies. Older still and got children, still applies. Got none of those things, but you're alive, still applies. <laughs> because it even says your own life in comparison to serving God. But the difficulty is, as this verse invites us into, this expectation here of knowing God and working with God and serving him and being his disciple. This opportunity now to experience this great level of intimacy. The difficulty is, we all like doing stuff. Anything, just give us something to do and we're happier. Because we get a sense of validation if we're doing something. However, that's not the way God wants it to be. Yes, we can work to become more Christ-like. That is good. That is noble. But it has to come from the place of being his disciple. There are a lot of people turning up sadly in churches, doing what they think is right, but they've not made Jesus the Lord of their life, and they're missing it. Oswald Chambers wrote this. It's not coming up, so you just have to listen to this. 
He says, we consider what we do in the way of Christian work as service. Yet Jesus Christ calls service to be what we are to him, not what we do for him. Discipleship is based solely on devotion to Jesus Christ, not on following after a particular belief or doctrine. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, he cannot be my disciple. We would so much rather prefer it that there was a list of things that we had to accomplish and we could go and do instead and we can then feel so much better about ourselves and look at this, yes, I am a disciple. But no, it's all about what we are in him. That's what we're called to be. So let's break this down a bit more. On the cross, Jesus said, feel free to finish this one, it is is finished so if it's finished it means it's finished and finished if you wish to look it up in the dictionary it means to bring to an end come to the end complete overcome completely finished so if Jesus says it's finished, what do you think it means? It's finished. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, the King James puts it that we are complete in him. Complete in him. Outside of him, we have all of our faults and failings and bits and pieces. And too often we look at ourselves outside of God. But we are complete in him. Complete means having all of its parts entire. It means finished. It means made perfect or whole. So in Christ, we are whole. It is finished. And we all give mental assent to that. We go, yes, we agree. It's finished. We're complete in him. But what's there for me to do? Is there something I can do? I was thinking, ooh. And this is the illustration I got. If I pulled out a box now with a hundred piece jigsaw, if we got 99 pieces down, is the jigsaw complete? No. If I got a hundred pieces down, is the jigsaw complete? Yes. And at 100 pieces, we can see the artist's work, we can see the neat edges, we can see the craftsmanship, we can see the full picture. But what if we go for 101 pieces and shoehorn something in? Or 102 and start blue tacking stuff on, sellotaping bits on, and all of a sudden the boundaries now and the borders start to become all wonky. Bits aren't looking quite the way they should do. The image is starting to get a bit blurred because that sellotape's pulling parts of the picture away. The problem is that's what we so often do with the things of God. We start sticking bits in. And then we wonder why things aren't quite as clear. It's finished. It's complete. We don't need to shoehorn anything in. We just need to be in him. It's not by our works. It is just based on the atonement of Christ, the finished work of Calvary, that relationship with him. Because of what Jesus did, we have holiness. God said, be holy because I am holy. Holiness means set apart for an ongoing purpose that God has for us. There isn't any one of us here who can make themselves more holy because the holiness is in him. And it comes from him. And it is him. 
We then have righteousness. Righteousness means right standing with God. So if it's right standing with God, and God's the one who puts us in right standing with him, then it means there's nothing we can do about it. Let's be honest, we're all a bit good at walking away from these bits and pieces and wandering off and walk, stepping out of the righteousness that God has for us and the holiness. And we can sometimes confuse getting right with God and coming back as doing something, but no, it's all Him. And it's only Him. We have sanctification. That means set apart. God calls us a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. He's called us out to him. We're God's property. Watch out world. If we just caught that. We can't make ourselves more set apart for God. It's he who does the work. Then we have the big one, salvation. I didn't even know I needed salvation until somebody told me. And then when they told me, I didn't believe them. <laughs> and then when they kept telling me, yeah. But then God breaks in. And he did it to each and every one of us. And then when he opens our eyes, when he opens our eyes, Then we're like Isaiah, we're just, uh, we're just undone. And that work of salvation, it's all his. We just turn up with the filth and the dross and our so-called goodness and just lay it down. And because he's done it all, there's nothing we can do. Yet we would rather like the no that there is something we can do. But no. It's all about relationship and loving him. And that's how we can then operate and be his disciple. We can turn around and say, okay, so there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can bring. But what about those gifts and talents that I have? Hey, what about those? Um, they're called gifts because God gave them you. Oh, so um, yeah, nothing there. There's only two things we can bring to God. Our heartfelt worship and adoration. We can give him that. The other thing we can give him is we can lay down the rights to our own lives. And we can say, Lord, have your way even when it might be uncomfortable and I might be volunteering for things that I don't like. But as we've been reminded, he's always with us. We're like the little child walking across the road with a parent. We might let go of the hand. He doesn't. He's got us. Now, the fact that we can't bring anything means that we can't do anything. He's done it all. We are called to be his disciple. Now, I was thinking about this being, and I turned around and thought, I understand the idea. I understand the concept, but how? So here's the example I have, which all of us can relate to. How many of you, when you were young, had your parents come up to you with a document and turn around and told you to pick your favorite crayon or anything else and to X here, sign here, mark there, and we'll witness this, and this is how you are going to operate and function as our son and daughter. And as you're going through life, you can turn to the other relevant pages and know how you are to conduct yourselves and how you are to behave. Anybody? No. None of us. Yet the thing is, we were us, the sons and daughters. It was because we were operating in a relationship of love. We trusted them. 
You know, I don't ever really remember coming in from playing with my mates and turning around and having to plead to be fed. There might not necessarily have been the stuff that I wanted on my plates. I mean, let's put it this way. I don't really know if many children turn and go, yippee, vegetables. <laughs> but we operated and we did because there was that relationship. And it was out of that relationship that we were the son and the daughter and we continue to be sons and daughters. Even when all the other things come in, there's still that being a son, being a daughter. A lot of us here can ex relate, relate to the other example of being. And that's when we become parents. I don't know about you, but when my daughters were born, no midwife came up with another document saying, right, sign here, dot, dot here, this is how you're going to be a parent. Children don't come with the instruction manual. And if you've had more than one, you know what applied to the one doesn't necessarily apply to the next one. <laughs> They're different. They're unique. They push different buttons. <laughs> and we don't turn around as parents and turn around and go, ah, oh, they're lovely. Ooh. Uh, somebody else take over when that nappy is filled. Or when they fall over and graze the knee. Or when they want stuff. We just... Because of our love for them, we want to provide. We want to guide. We want to raise them up. We just be the parent. And as they're growing, as they're moving, yes, how we have to parent, how we function changes, and it, we have to adapt. Yes, we learn on the job. But we be the parent. We're not turning around getting at the end of the day and thinking, oh, did we do this, 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 and this. We just be. And that's what God's inviting us to be. We're called the children of God. He calls us his sons and daughters. And so, just as we functioned with our parents of just being, God's calling us to be. He's done it all. You see, it's not about what we do for God. It's about what we do with him. Now let me clarify the with him. It doesn't mean as a builder may use a tool and get a job done. No, that's not the with him. We are the clay. He is the potter. When I say with God, I mean working alongside him being led by him, guided by him. That's the working with God. Jesus turns around and says that his yoke is easy because we're just called to be and walk with him. A few verses after this verse, Jesus does mention about carrying the cross, our cross. Now at that point, we can get excited and think, yes, there's something for us to do. But what he's actually saying is, guess what? You're going to have to crucify your wants, your life, your ambition daily and just be my disciple. You're going to have to let stuff go and be. So the fighting and the striving that's within us is fighting and striving against our desire to want to do something. He's calling us to B. Oswald Chambers, again, sorry, here we go. He said, Our Lord's primary obedience was to the will of his Father, not to the needs of people. The saving of people was the natural outcome of his obedience to the Father. Our Lord's primary obedience was to the will of his Father, not to the needs of the people. The saving of the people was the natural outcome of his obedience to the Father. Yes, we want to see our loved ones saved. We want to see our town saved. We want to see our neighbours saved. We want to see our work colleagues saved. We want to see more of God moving in our, in our midst. 
But the way to get there is to seek the Father. If we're seeking him, being his disciple, him above everything else, him in the right place, then it will all flow. And it will just be the outworking. Another example we have is Paul, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul often refers to himself as a bond servant. He wasn't the only person who referred to himself as a bond servant. Peter did it, and what some of the, several of the other New Testament writers called themselves a bond servant of Christ. Now, some translations don't use bond servant, but I've been told, but bond servant, there's a real something there. And I just want to look at that for a minute. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 to 17, it's not coming up, I'm just going to read it for you. So if you want to take it for your notes, it's Deuteronomy 15, verses 12 to 17. It says, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this today. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you, because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your bondservant forever. And to your female slave, you shall do the same. This is what the bondservant is. The bondservant is somebody, because of a debt, they ended up in servitude to another. Then when the year of release came along, they were to be furnished, given provision, and sent home. So they could go back now, the debt's cleared, and they can start afresh. But if that person turns around and has a love for the person in the household, a relationship, they could turn around of their own choosing if they wish and say, no, I want to stay here. And then they would be marked, be all through the ear, so it would be known that they were a bond servant. When Paul compares himself and says he's a bond servant, he's reminding us that each and every one of us had a debt. A debt none of us could pay. And when we came to Jesus and experienced salvation, the debt's wiped away. And we have all of those promises from God. And God's love and his mercy and his righteousness. And if we want... We can go from there and let's say that's enough and go off and do and try and cope. Or we can realize that in the Father's house, in the Father's house, if we choose to be the bond servant, mm. there'll be no want, there'll be no lack. Yes, in our lives, we may very well experience those things and difficulties, but that's because we're having to function in this world, but we're actually belonging to another one. The bond servant is the person who's going to be the disciple because they're happy to just be in the Father's house. The hired help are the ones sitting there going, Six years, six months, six years, five years, four years, three years, two years, one year. Oh, here's me good, spank, and they're gone. Are we just here to see what we get from God? Or are we here to be his disciple? If we're going to be his disciple, he has to be in the right position. If our children, if our parents, 
if our spouse, if our own life is considered to us more precious than him, then we've got an idol. Because God says you'll have no other God before me. If God isn't the main thing, then things can't flow as they should. We have that hundred piece jigsaw. Mm -hmm. How many pieces has yours got? Sometimes mine has more than a hundred. And I have to turn around and kind of go, no wonder things don't look clear. I'm trying to do bits myself and prune it back to the original hundred. We know it is finished. We will say it is finished. But do we really truly accept it is finished? Sorry for the interruption. What I really struggle with in life, I'm very, very thankful for God who's given me the wisdom, knowledge, and the gift. It's not my gift, it's his gift. Now, for the last couple of weeks, it's been an absolute success because I went through tests and all sorts. It's not my own doing, it's God's doing, because I didn't do any revision when I passed. <laughs> now, my biggest struggle is, when you say that you want to train someone or help someone to share that gift, what I struggle with, they got the wrong attitude. Yeah. Ad <laughs> if somebody hasn't got the right attitude, an attitude can't be taught, they just have to be shown this is it. And that's the difficulty if you bring things like that. And also, there's a good chance you may, you're probably trying to teach somebody who doesn't know the Lord. There's no mercy. The grace isn't there. There's all of those things. And there's a lot there which could be looked at in the natural and all of other sorts of things. But that's why we're told as a Christians here, if anyone comes to him and doesn't hate, that have that sense of indifference to or relative disregard to in comparison to things of God. In the world, it's all me, 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 me. And when you're coming along and me, 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 and you're the person who is more than happy to lay it down, there's going to be the clash. You see, one of the things as Christians we can slip up in is we can sometimes make ooh, our quiet time, our prayer time, our me time with God, the bigger thing than it should be. It's good. We should have those things, those disciplines. But we're called to relationship. Yeah. And it's out of relationship. Chambers says this, the secret of a disciple's life is devotion to Jesus Christ. The secret of our life is devotion to Jesus Christ. Then everything falls in place. Then everything in our lives can function. It will still mean we're going to be rubbing up against those to whom it's not going to function because they don't know Jesus yet. So, it all comes down to that relationship. The relationship whereby we can bring nothing, the relationship where it's all done, it's all complete. The question is, will we be his disciple? And that is where I close. So let's just pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, that you've done it all. There is nothing left for us to pick up. There is nothing left for us to work out. 
there was nothing left for us to look up. We haven't got to achieve anything, Lord God. It doesn't matter what we are in life or where we are in life. It doesn't matter, Lord God, what our income is, Lord. It doesn't matter, Lord God, what education is, Lord God. None of these things, Lord God, matter because it's all about your finished work of Calvary. You, Heavenly Father, are the one who sent your Son that the whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, help each and every one of us to keep you front and center. To remember that you are walking beside us each and every moment of each and every day. You are available at all times. You are willing at all times. Help each and every one of us, Lord, to be your disciple. In Jesus' name.